Hello everyone. Okay, I'm going to bring to you the Sunday School lesson, um, lesson number seven for the week of October 15th. Um, the title of the lesson is A Backsliding People. The lesson text comes from Judges 2, 16 through 23. The golden text reads, The Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Judges 2 and 16. I'm going to read the introduction. Whisper word of prayer, get into the lesson. But first, we have three outlines. We have God's plan, Judges 2, 16 and 17. Then we have God's patience, Judges 2, 18 and 19. And then we have God's anger. And that's Judges 2, 20 through 23. I'm going to read the introduction, get into the lesson. And during the three centuries following, following the death of Joshua, um, is, Israel's history followed a cycle repeated. Um, repeated over and over again. The people fell into apostasy and came under the the domination of a pagan nation until the people cried to God and then he sent deliverers or judges to free them. Then they served the Lord for a time before again uh, apostatizing, turning turning away, starting the cycle again, over again. Now among Israel's judges um, were an array of men and, and, and one woman. And these included Othniel, Ehud, Ehud um, Sham, Shamgar, Deborah, Barak, Gideon, Abimelech. Um, though many would not include him, Tola, Jer, um, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, and Samson. Samuel could also be considered one of the judges of Israel. So these Israel, these individuals were not so much judges charged with settling disputes as they were deliverers or saviors appointed by God to deal with oppression um, by Israel's enemies. Now Joshua died when he was 110 years old. And after he and his generation passed off the scene, another generation rose up um, that was not close, um, in close communion with God, with the Lord and what he had done for Israel. Our our lesson, our lesson, text for this lesson deals with the inter- institution of judges, and it is a general description of how God used them to help Israel. So we see here that no matter um, how Israel continued to turn their backs on God, God always would come and help them out and send someone to rescue and deliver them, and that's what he did in this lesson, and he sent judges. I'm going to whisper a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, thank you for this day, Lord God. Thank you for letting us see a day which we've never seen before and a day we'll never see again. I pray that we do the best of our ability to make, bring glory to your name, Lord God, and to make you proud of us as your belie- as believers. I pray that this lesson touches each and every one of our hearts, and if we are backsliders, Lord, help us to turn back to you, Lord God. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, first outline God's plan, and that's coming from um, Judges 2, verses 16 and 17. But first I want to read a little something where it talks about the um, the judges. And I know a lot of times, because I know for a long time I thought this way. Um, when we thought, When I thought of judges or when I heard of judges, I thought it was like the judges in a courtroom. But here we're going to learn it's not it's not that same kind of judges. It's not the judges that were you know that would um you know settling disputes, um but they were deliverers. They were actually military um military people. Um, and it talks about here. It just says um. God called deliverers. Joshua had provided a stable, effective leadership, but after his death, the nation of Israel had entered a time of turmoil and political unrest called the period of the judges now since there was no central government or leadership judges usually were local or regional leaders who were inspired by god to respond to particular um problems these leaders were called judges but they were not judges in the sense that they that we use the word judges most um were not even involved in it most were not involved in judicial or legal issues nor were they religious leaders for the most part they were military leaders who led the israelites in throwing off oppression now the israelites went through a repeated cycle of behaviors during the period of the judges so now we're going to see how first they um 
rebelled against God. They broke the covenant. I'm sorry. They broke the covenant. They followed false gods. And then um, when God would send the enemy to oppress them, then, of course, they cry out to God. And then they turn back. And and then they, you know, for for a minute, um, they, you know, worship God. And But when it, when it got, when they got comfortable, then they would go right back. And it's just like, I just wonder, I have a question. Why is it that we disobey God when he wants us to do, um, when he tells us to do the right thing? We disobey him when he tells us. He tells us through his word. He tells us through um, preaching of the gospel when the, when the pastor or the, or the minister gets up to preach. He tells us time and time again what not to do. He tells us the right things to do, but yet we still turn and do the wrong things. But then when we get in trouble... What do we do? We run back to God and we cry, we pray, and we're on our knees and, you know, we cry out to the Lord. And he, he delivers us. He helps us. But then, you know, when that wears off, what happens? We turn right back into our own sinful ways. And that's just what the Israelites, the Israelites did this so many times that you just wonder why God just kept delivering them because they were God's chosen people and God loved them. But um, the thing is, no matter what, he loved them, but he still had to show them um, um, he meant what he said. And there's consequences um, to sin. So I'm going to get into the lesson. Verse um, 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. I'm, I'm going to read all, all the verses and then I'm going to break it down. So nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them, and the, and turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not do so. Um, and when the Lord raised, raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hands of their enemies um, all the days of the judge. of the judge, For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they um, returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down unto them. And they ceased not from their, their um, own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because um, that this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened, and have, they have not hearkened unto my voice. I would also, he said, I also would not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he um, when he died. That through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. So he's like, are they going to do it or not? Therefore the Lord. I'm sorry, therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So now we have God's, so here we see God's plan, verses 16 and 17. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges. Now he delivered them out of the hands of those oppressors, but yet they would not hearken or listen to the judges. But they went a horn after other gods, and when they he talks about a horn after other gods, pretty much it, um, they went they it, they were in idolatry, um, and bowed themselves unto them, and then they turned quickly out of the way. That's apostasy. The turning away is apostasy, um, and that's when he talks about apostasy. It, they turned away from the way that their fathers walked in, obeying and obeying the their fathers obeyed the commandments. So the way that the fathers walked in was obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not do so. So here we see deliverance. Now the Lord used pagan people to chastise the Israelites for their sins. And it was his sovereign, you know, of course it was it was his his own, you know, his own prerogative to do what he wanted to do as far as chastising his people. Now they forsook his his special people. They forsook him on a regular basis, which is really sad. It's like Oh, it just sound like us today on a regular basis. Um, when we do things and then God delivers us out of them, then we go right back. So here when it talks about they forsook him on a regular basis. Are we forsaking God on a regular basis? That's a good question to ask ourselves. But this is what they did. And, and 
Um, but he did not forsake them. Just like us, God would never leave us nor forsake us. No matter how much we forsake God, he never forsakes us. No matter how much we turn away and come back, he still accepts us. Um, now, if it appears that he did what he did, um, that has to be seen in light of his plan of discipline for them. He did what he did to discipline his people. We know there's consequences to sin, and we know that God hates sin, and so there's going to be some serious consequences to sin. And that is why God raised up judges from from time to time to lead Israel, the Israelites in their oppression to in their opposition to oppression. And grant them the deliverance that they needed. Now the Israelites, um, they operated under a theocratic monarchy. And God served as king and he appointed the judges. Okay, um, They were in leadership positions for a limited time. So this is what the judges, so he had called judges. Because you know he had the leaders like he had Joshua, he had Moses, and he had those um, that led you know, the children of Israel. But you know when Joshua died or those leaders died... When Joshua died, then he raised up judges. Um, I'm sorry. Um, he raised up, so then he appointed the judges, and they were in leadership positions for a limited time, and they had no royal family line to succeed them as earthly kings did. So some were also limited to certain sections of Canaan rather than the whole land. So judges were for a specific time and for a specific area. Now, here is the disappointment. We first, we had the deliverance. Now, God delivered them. He delivered them, and they still go back and forth. So now we have the disappointment. Now, the Lord and all who sought to serve him, they were bitterly disappointed. Do we want God to be disappointed in us? Or do we want to serve him, and we want God to be proud of us? You know, it's just like a kid who wants their parent. They do the best of their ability to make their parents, parents proud. We should be as believers to the best of our ability doing everything we can to make God proud, to show show God, you know, make him proud, um, continue to serve him and um, follow him and not turn away after the worldly things with, you know, idolatry because everything in the world that is contrary to God, um, which is not good for us, it's not good for us, not good, you know, for us to do, but we still turn to those things and turn away from God. Um, as we, as we shall see, the people became even more wayward when their judges died. So it's like, it's like, no matter, it's like, what is it going to take to get people to see or just believe that God is who he is? And I think the thing is, is we really don't like, I, I know, like Pastor Lewis say, and we believe that there is a God. People believe there is God, but people don't believe God because I really believe if we believe God for real, for real. We would not do a lot of things that we do. We would not live like the world lives. We would not continue to do things that God tells us not to do things that are against, you know, God and his word. Um, but for some reason, we just keep going back. And then a lot of times things that, that um, are sinful for us are also not good for us. You know, um, things that you do that we may do in our lifetime will probably come follow us when we get older. And then we'll see that we, we reap. The consequences of those sins that we did in the days, you know, when we were younger. And, um, but then we'll cry out to God for deliverance or for healing or for whatever it is. And God, he hears us. And God sends those who we need to come and help us, to deliver us. We get delivered. Turn right around. Once it feels good, you know, it's like, okay, I'm good now. I ain't got to worry about it. And we go right back into our sins, our idolatry. And yet, and then we call on God again. But God is very patient. But God is, was disappointed. He's very disappointed in the people. The sinfulness of the Israelites was displayed in two primary ways. First, they chased after other gods. They worshipped other gods. Um, um, they worshipped by pagans in the land of Canaan. Then they bowed down to them. And you know what the the, the um, Ten Commandments, what one of the, the ten, one of the Ten Commandments says. Thou shalt not have no other God before me. Um, and thou shalt not bow down and worship them. Um, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor, th nor shalt thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And that's the, um, um, the first two of the Ten Commandments. So they bowed down to them, which violated the first two 
of the Ten Commandments. Now, the second way the Israelites displayed their sinfulness was by turning quickly out of the way. I mean, quickly. They turn quickly. How quickly do we turn out of the way? Ask yourself that question. How quickly do we turn out of the way? One minute we might... And it's really funny. I think um, we we turn to God like on Sundays when we go to church and we put our, our best our best face church face on, our best church attitude on on Sundays. But as soon as we leave, quickly, as soon as we leave the church, we're back into our, our old ways. And God is not happy with that. God is disappointed. We don't want to make God disappointed. Believers today can take a lesson from the ancient Israelites. Despite the advantages we might have today, the threat of backsliding and apostasy is always present. The threat of it. Then there's a threat of it, but we don't have to bow down to it. And there's always, the world we live in, there's going to always be a threat of backsliding and apostasy for us believers because of the world we live in, the fallen world we live in. Allowing anything or anybody to displace our devotion to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit can develop into spiritual idolatry. Even the Apostle John, in his writing in the latter part of the first century, he also admonished them. He said, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, Scripture indicates that idolatry is closely connected with demonic activity. Wow. One of the disturbing developments in our world today is the growth of pagan religions, occult organizations, and New Age teachings. And all we see all of this going on, but yet we flock to it because we like the way it sounds or we, you know, which we know. To, I don't understand. This is what I don't understand. Why do people flock to things that are not of God? Um, like you'll find somebody that are, that are, that are end up in a, either a cult or new or new like this new age religion or this new age teachings they'll flock to that and they'll talk about it all day long but i don't understand why they don't talk about god why they don't flock to god and his word i just never understood that but that's exactly what happens you know we we turn um or we turn away from the truth and we we turn into the world's um systems of error leading to apostasy and its consequences So now we have God's patience, and this is verses 18 and 19. And when the Lord raised them up judges, and the Lord Lord was with the judge, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judges, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. So, you know, when God raised the judges because he felt bad when he, I know, he, well, he sent, he, you know, sent the oppressors in. But, of course, listening, hearing his, his, um, his people, you know, grown and, you know, by reason of the oppression of those, you know, of those who oppressed them, the enemy, you know, those who oppressed them. But God had patience. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupt and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods <clears throat> to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not. From their own doings, um, nor from their stubborn way. Um, so here we see, we have sympathy. We see sympathy. The first part of the verse repeats um, what was stated in verse sixteen, but it adds, "The Lord raised up judges to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge." Keep that in mind while looking forward to verse nineteen, for that will tell us what happened after the judges died. In the latter half of verse 18, the concern this that concerns us here, we are faced with a problem with the meaning of the word repented. If God is omniscient, all-knowing, then why did he decide something and then later repent it? Well, because he loved his, his people. Um he you know, he is he is unchanging and it is actually possible for, um it's possible for him to change his mind and do something different. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. So it is possible. I know we we say, you know, God, um, if he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. But God is also, you know, lovable. He's unmovable. We know he's unchangeable, but he can change his mind if he wants to. Now, um, um, although God knows the end from the beginning regarding his dealings with us, we are required to walk by faith and not by sight. 
His ear is always open to our cry and his love um, ready to be poured out upon us. We are responsible to obey God faithfully and should never blame him in our waywardness, um, which brings his, chast- his chastisement upon us. We can't blame God. You know, you know, this is interesting too. In life, when things happen, um, say something happens to us, we blame God or we get mad at God when we have to look back over our life when it was something that we've done to bring us to where we are. And it's just a part of being chastened. It's just a part of being disciplined. And it's just what we have to deal with. And we can't blame God. You know, a lot of people blame God for a lot of things that go on. But we got to realize we're in a fallen world. Um, We're just a part of it. It rains on the just and the unjust. So we're just a part of that. Um, But these these people um, continue to um, turn against God. Um, They continue to to disobey him. And then when something happened and they want to be upset and groan and, you know, but God is still faithful and God has sympathy. So now we see the stubbornness um, in in verse 19, the stubbornness Um, after the judges and it came to pass when the judges were dead, then they turned. They turned back and corrupted themselves even more, worse, even more, more than their fathers in following other gods. Terrible. Um, As mentioned before, verse 17 seems to indicate indicate that the Israelites were wayward while their judges were alive. Verse 19 speaks of the um, people's waywardness after the judges died. Even after deliverance, deliverance, the apostasy seems to have continued. It's like, I deliver you, you be good for a minute, then you go back. And, you know, um, sometimes that, that, that's going to run out. I think a lot of times we bank on that because we we don't think, oh, God, we just don't think things are going to happen. We, we think we have time, but time is running out. We don't really have time because we don't know. God knows, but we don't know when we're going to take our last breath. And so for these people to 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 rebel against God, then, then cry out, and then he delivers them. And it's like you weren't even grateful for what God did. You still went back into the way that he delivered you from, that he saved you from the oppressors. But that's just, and you know what? That's t- I, I had come up with this a long time ago. That's the insanity of sin. Because sin, it really has you insane because you really don't think that sin is bad. You know, we do things, but the insanity of sin makes us think that what we're doing is not wrong. When it's wrong to do it, because God told us not to, and it's also um, not good for us. You know, it it can have you know things that you know things that can happen to us. So I'm going to go into the last outline, which is God's anger. So we know that God, um, He's patient. God, uh, we saw God's plan, um, God's patience, but now we see God's anger, and we don't want to make God angry. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because this people, that this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice. So he said, I commanded their fathers, so you follow the same commandments that I gave your fathers. But you guys not listening? You not hearing me? I will also not henceforth drive out anyone from before them out of the nations which Joshua left when he died. So those nations that oppressed them, he said, I'm going to drive them out. You want to keep going back? You want to keep doing wrong? I'm a, I'm not going to drive him out. He says that um, He says through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the, the way of the Lord to walk therein as their father did or not. So he's saying, I'm going to do this. He said, and I'm going to prove them. He says, um, he says, I will see. He says, whether they will keep the way of the, fa- the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did to keep it. Or not. He says. Um, Therefore the Lord left those nations. Without driving them out. And hastily. Out hastily neither delivered them. Ne- ne- I'm sorry. Neither delivered he them. Into the hand of Joshua. So now we have the decision. Many many um, today want to portray God. Only as loving and kind. Which we know he is loving and kind. But they want to portray him. Only as loving and kind. But you know God is just. And he will bring down fire when he has to. 
um, regardless of how they treat him. He is. He's loving, just, kind, regardless of how we treat him. No matter how many times we come to him, God is still there for us. But we always turn our backs on him. Um, you know, yeah. You know, people have phrases for God and they disrespect him in a lot of ways. Um, verse 20 declares that the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. This is a blunt statement that cannot be reduced to something less severe. Since God does not change, we can be sure that um, he is just as angry with sinners today as he was then. God hates sin. He hated it then. He hates it now. And this is the most sobering thought. God made a decision regarding the Israelites who have broken his covenant. He said he would not drive all of the heathens out of the land after Joshua, um, the land of Canaan after Joshua died. He said, um, so let us back up and look at three scripture passages that show that the Israelites have been adequately warned about what God would do if they were unfaithful to him. He warned them. And this is what I'm going to do. But so you still going to not do the right, do the right thing? Moses has said, if you would not drive out, if, if ye would not drive out the inhabitants of the land, um, from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which um, yet remain of them, I'm sorry, shall be pricks in your eye and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Joshua said, Know for certain that the Lord your God will no more drive out the, um, any of those nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges. And the angel of the Lord said, Just prior to the beginning of the period of the judges, ye shall make no league with the um, inhabitants of this land ye should throw down their altars but ye have not obeyed my voice why have ye done this wherefore i also said i would not drive them out from before you and you shall they shall they shall be as a thorn in your sides and their god shall be a snare unto you so now here we see that this is an interesting verse to analyze god said that he used pagan people of canaan to prove or test um, Israel. He allowed these heathen people to maintain their, um, fun to maintain, to maintain their alive and functioning in the midst of his chosen people in order to display or reveal Israel's spiritual character, character or lack of it. They served as a thermometer to show whether the Israelites were spiritually warm, um, spiritually warm, um, whatever this was, tepid or cold. If the Israelites sternly resisted pagan beliefs and practices and refrained from intermarrying with the heathen, if they, if they tried to turn these wicked people toward the Lord, these would be signs that all was well. If the Israelites held themselves um, and tolerated pagan activities, this would indicate spiritual apathy. If they forsook the way of the Lord and moved over the line into pagan worship and practices, their apostasy would be evident. It was the latter that all too happened off too often. He deliver them, then they go right back. But this time he said, "I'm not. I'm not letting them out of the land. I'm gonna let them stay there, and I'm gonna see either you are for me or you're not. It's just like us. Either we're for God or we're not. We have to. We have to make a choice. Um, this lesson is talking about backsliding. Um, if we're backsliding, we need to get it right." If we're straying, turning away, then we need to get it right. It has been said that those um, forgot the lesson of history. I'm sorry. Those forget the lesson. The lessons of history um, are doomed to repeat its mistakes. The book of Judges makes, the very makes it very clear with its records of the repeated cycle of apostasy, oppression, and deliverance. If we are wise, we will learn to stay true to God doing our part and trusting him to do what he has promised. And that is, um, this is the victorious living. So let us be, um, let us let us live for God. Let us worship God. Let us um, just do the right things. Turn away from sin. Turn away from waywardness. Turn to God and stay there. Now, we, you know, one is like, it's like, a, like I say, we always think we have time. Like, I'm going to do it just one more time. Then I'm going to turn back. I'm going to do it one more time. Well, one time it's going to be too late because you might turn and not get a chance to turn back. It's going to be too late. But we need to get it together with God um, and just be real about who God is in our lives and just 
you know, continuing his word, continuing his way. And let's not backslide. Let's not be like these Israelites who we we see all through the Bible when we read all these lessons that Israel for forever against God. Then they turn back. They do right for a little while. And then they go right back. But God loved them so much that he delivers them every time. So, um, but it's just sad. And, you know, it's like, how much do we appreciate God for delivering us, for saving us, for keeping us? So then we have to do the right thing. Let him be proud of us and not disappointed in us. I pray that this lesson has helped someone. I pray that we just continue to be, um, be doers of the word, not just hearers, but to be doers and live like God tells us to live. Um, let's turn. Let's, let's stay turned should i say let's stay turned let's not turn back let's stay turned so that so the thing is in the world we live in today our test is when god proves us are we gonna live for god or not that's the question may god bless and keep you is my prayer